<laughs> I'm a little excited this morning because we're doing something new with video. Something that I really didn't expect. You know, I was getting ready this weekend to work on upgrading and adding to or changing this week's weekly word and delicious. And thinking about other things that go on during the week that lots of times affect me in some way that, you know, I read about or I hear about or people get all wrapped up about. Some emotional response to their situation or circumstances that really dramatically affect their faith in some way that probably should not have bothered them at all. As a matter of fact, Jesus said that emotions should not be part of our devotion. They should be relegated to that response of knowing God and responding to Him in emotional ways, yes, but our faith as far as our assurances are concerned regarding our salvation or God's provision or knowing who God is and how He'll take care of us, those things should be automatic. They should be confidently expected. Our hope should always be in the Lord. And quite frankly, I've heard a lot of pastors recently putting their hope in everywhere else. You know, Israel, when they were afraid, they turned their trust into Egypt because Egypt was a mighty warrior. And sometimes people do that in modern days. They put their trust in, you know, going out and buying a gun or they get a new security system and they feel secure. Well, you know, a gun doesn't do much in a hurricane. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like the wrong thing for the wrong situation. And that's often what most people do. They put their trust in the wrong things for the wrong situation. When you can't control your life, then you put your trust in the author of life. You put your confidence in the God who created the universe because men really have no clue what they're doing. As a matter of fact, God said it this way. He said that if you put your trust in men, you'll be disappointed. And quite frankly, recent elections have proven that people that put their trust in men often get disappointed in elections. They think somehow one man is going to change everything for them. They get their hopes and emotions all wrapped up in some election or some government or some idea or some protest. And I often have to ask them, well, when you got done with what you did, when you used your freedom that God has given you in grace to exercise it according to the way you wanted, how did you feel about it when you got done using your freedom to accomplish what you wanted to do? Were you rejoicing in it? Were you satisfied with the amount of time and energy and effort that you put into it? Were you confident about what you just did? If you are, go for it. I'm happy for you. I often say it this way, how's that working out for you? Because, you see, God has really given us a lot of liberty in Jesus. Now, he warns us that, hey, God's not mocked, whatsoever a man soweth, that also shall he reap. So, don't get me wrong, you may have freedom, but that freedom is the ability to receive in your flesh the consequences of your own actions. Oh, your salvation of your spirit may be accomplished, but there are things that will still cause you great suffering and anxiety and anxiousness if you're living according to the flesh and not the spirit. So I was really looking forward to today to starting this new way of approaching the mornings, you know, looking at it from God's perspective, vidivo mornings, taking it from a personal and intimate relationship that I have with Jesus and bringing forth the Word, the Word of God, as He's given it to us today to live. And that's what I'm doing with Daily Light, is that we're going to relate Daily Light in Video Morning every morning, because it's broken up into morning and night. And we're going to relate in Video Night a uh, evening devotion, you know, that we can share the Word of God, starting our day with the Word of God, so you know where I'm at. And if you're listening and watching, I'll know where you're at because you're on the same page as I am. And that's kind of where we want to be, you know. Is we don't want to be like off-kilter, off-center, off in left field, or way out in right field. 
What we really want to do is be on target for what God has intended for us. And there's only really one way to do that. And that's not by following men, because as you've seen probably recently in the elections, even pastors jumped into the pulpit and started preaching not religion, but politics. They started making their religion justify their selection for a advocate for their morality. And God didn't honor it. God said, no, I reject your manipulation of my word of God in order to be used in a religious context. God doesn't allow for us to manipulate his word. He'll always reveal the truth. And that's why Jesus said, men love darkness more than they love the light. Lest their deeds be proven whether they be of God or of men. The elections recently were proven that obviously all this promotion was of men, was not of God. And godly men stumbled and fell over it. Most people just decided, hey, you know, if my preacher, my teacher, my elder, my deacon, my whatever is trying to tell me to vote, and I look at it and I can't come up with a godly decision based upon the wisdom of the Word of God, as well as sitting down and praying and asking Jesus about it, I'm not going to vote. Period. And I think a lot of people did that because the turnout was horrible. And until they figure that out, I'm sorry, but it just isn't going to turn out the way they think. And that's why we need to always focus our attention on what God is telling us to do. Because men can stumble no matter who they are. Whether it be the president all the way down to the pastor. Whether it be an elder, a deacon, or whether it be just a simple human being like you and I. Because even sinners can be used by God as well as those saved by grace. So we need to examine ourselves to find out if we be in the faith as Jesus warned of these latter days. So in Vidivo mornings, we want to begin our mornings in the Word of God and end it at night in the Word of God. Today, the Lord shared with us. He led them on safely. I lead in the way of righteousness, in the midst of the paths of judgment. Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place where I have prepared. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them. And he bore them and carried them all the days of old. They got not the land in possession by their own sword. Neither did they their own arm save them. But thy right hand and thine arm and the light of thy countenance, because thou hast favor unto them. So didst thou lead thy people to make thyself a glorious name. Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness. Because of my enemies, lead me. Make thy way straight before my face. O send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me into the holy hill and to thy tabernacles. Then will I go unto the altar of the Lord my God and unto God my exceeding joy. Yes, upon the harp will I praise you, O God, my God. Often we're left with that thought. Is God real? Most people say yes. But I have to ask, is God real in your life? Are you making sure you really believe there is a God and that God is active in your life? Or are you just putting some faith in this idea that circumstances, if they work out good, that's God? If they work out for you, that's God. If they seem to be what the pastor said, that's God. Let me be clear. God is real. God is a supreme being who is not some kind of mystical, everlasting sugar daddy father who's going to give you bountiful life, you know, and you can have whatever you want. Just ask for it and you'll get it if you have enough faith. No. The reality is in these latter days, God is coming to reveal himself. And it says that there would be a time when an army would come down from the north and it would be so annihilated that God would reveal himself to his people again. That to me shows some big deal about to happen. Some of the big deals that have happened in the past have been recorded in the Bible. And we've proven that God is real by them. Now you may not have sat down and decided in this time of grace and mercy where God is reaching out to save people 
whether or not God is real in your life, but I have. I was faced with death, period. People told me I was dying. I had no hope, no chance of recovery, that I would be dead before I was 30. And I was already born again. I had marvelous religious experiences, emotional experiences, but suddenly I was faced with the reality of, oh wow, how real is my faith? How confident am I? And you know what I did? I said, hey, I'm not worried about dying. I just don't want to be miserable while I'm doing it. So I studied my Bible and I just kept going. I didn't change my way of life because I knew I was dying. As a matter of fact, I rejoiced in what I had, what little time left, in order to appreciate who Jesus was. And while living in that hospital bed for over a year and sometimes even longer in and out before the time passed that I was supposed to expire, all Scott ever did with me was simply to reassure me and to comfort me and to be with me, to talk to me to give me strength in my faith that I would need for the future, especially among believers. Because I find that most people don't really believe there is a God. They don't put the rubber to the road and say, hey, I need to know, God, if you're real. I need to find out if you're a fact or you're a fantasy. I need to find out if you actually intervene in the ways of man or you're just some kind of mystical idea that people make up out of a philosophical idea of a religious psychology that somehow it's better for my life if I just believe in something. No! I'm not a pastor saying that and I'm not sitting here as a teacher teaching that and I'm not a person sitting here that doesn't experience God daily in my life. Period. God is real and he intervenes in the lives of his people every single day. The sun rises and sets because God set it in order. He told us that if you can see nature, you can see God. And in the very trinity, the very aspect of the Godhead is revealed in nature. When Jesus said that you have seen me, you have seen the Father, he meant it. He wasn't kidding. And the very fact that he said, my sheep hear my voice and they know me, and they will not follow the voice of another, means that you can know the voice of God and hear him speak to you, David. That's your choice to do, to prove and to find out. Because if you don't know, then you're just bouncing around like a pinball in a pinball machine, operating according to what the world is doing with its flippers. And you're being flicked from one side to another, never really resting in one place. But the end of the world is coming. God will reveal himself, and one day it says that he'll peel back the heavens as though they were just a tin can. And then people will be terrified when they see how real God actually is. When Jesus came, he said, I have come sent of my Father. You have heard it said, and he revealed all the different things that religious people had told them about how God of Old Testament was so mean and beat up and, you know, like terrifying and devastating, and how he really was like, oh, so, you know, you got to stand back so far away from his holiness that, you know, you'd be consumed like a, you know, match in a fire, you know. Only Jesus came and said, no, that's not my father. That's your God. And you don't even know whose father you are. But that may be your God. But my father loves you. My father has something for you. And it's not just a plan. It's not something that you get to run away with. But it's an intimate, personal relationship that I have with my father that I'm praying you have, too, with your father who is in heaven. I will give you the Holy Spirit in order for you to understand that and to know it and to be as intimate as I am. But you need to develop it. You as a person need to get to the realization of knowing Jesus personally in such a way that you can say, I know my God, and he would not tell me to do something like that. I know my God because today I heard his voice. Not just reading it, like we did in Daily Light today, but also taking the time, making the time, breaking the mold of your religious ideas and stopping long enough to talk to God. Father, I thank you for this day that you have made, that you have given, that you have created for us to enjoy what time we do have left. And what little time on this earth we have left, I pray that you may use it accordingly, according to your will, but also so that we might be better prepared to meet you face to face. Because God, you're coming again. You've sent your Son, and He will reveal Himself in the fullness of time. 
and we'll see him as he is, a lamb slain before the foundations of the world. And we'll mourn for him because he will bear the scars of our sin. And God, thank you. Though I feel sorrowful for the fact that he has endured those things for me, I'm thankful that you have made a way for me to escape condemnation, but to find salvation. So today, Father, because you love me, help me to see you in a more intimate way, in a real way that demonstrates who you are, how you are, the way you are. So I would not be deaf and dumb and blind standing in heaven one day or standing in hell wondering what happened and how I got that way. But rather, God, you would have mercy upon me, doing whatever it takes to accomplish your purposes so I can know you whatever that may be. Because God, at this point in time, as much as I think I know so much, may it be that as the proverb says, to trust in you with all my heart, to lean not in my own understanding, I ask you would take that for all of us, to not lean in our own understanding, but that you prove to you, to us, you prove to me and you prove to the people watching who you are, how you are, the way you are. And in Jesus, I pray that you would so much so Intercede for the people that don't know you, Jesus. That they would come to a perfect realization that it's not a religious thing, it's not a church thing, but it's rather a personal, intimate reality that a person can know in the side of the intimacy of their own heart, the tenderness that you are, and that they can fall upon their face, even in the privacy of their own home or, or place or wherever they are and call upon you when no one sees and you'll respond to them. So God, I don't pray for the high and mighty. Let them accomplish what they're supposed to do according to their ways, render unto them what they've sown. But I do pray for the poor and needy, for those who are crying out in these latter days that really do, God, need you. Help us, Lord, as you have mercy upon us and have mercy upon us as you help us because God, if we were prosperous as we've been, then we would fall away from you. But rather, reveal yourself more intimately than you ever have before. Not so we would be led astray by emotions, but that we would see the heart of love that you have for not just ourselves, but for the world so that we might do what you want us to. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, for me, that's what it boils down to. Am I doing what I was created to be? Am I becoming the man I'm supposed to be? Am I accomplishing the purpose God wants for me? I don't know. I only know that I examine myself according to the Word of God and I seek to follow it every day of my life. I seek to ask God to show me, to help me, to forgive me when I fall because I fail every day, but also to help me along my way as I'm walking each day according to His Word, according to His will, according to His Spirit, and according to the plan that God has for my life. May that be the same for you, that God would bless you with the knowledge of Himself in such a way that you demonstrated to yourself that you can know God intimately, that you know He's real, and that nothing will ever be able to take you or separate you from Him because He is in you.